1974, the world was <laughs> gifted via Eurovision with the most iconic act it has ever and will ever likely produce outside of Conchita Wurst. Uh, this band that won the 1974 Eurovision contest has now produced two, count them, two musicals, one of which is more well-known and one of which is less well-known, especially in the States. Um, the less well-known one that we'll not be talking about today is actually one of Josh Groban and Adina Menzel's favorite musicals. Um, Josh has actually talked about this, uh, trying to get it more, uh, trying to get more people in the States to watch it. But we're not talking about chess today. We're talking about Mamma Mia. Specifically, we're talking about the movie Mamma Mia, not the stage musical Mamma Mia. But it's all pretty much the same good time. Hello, Magnus. <laughs> Hello. I've got ABBA songs playing in my head as we speak. That's Talk good, because that's the whole point. Uh, the So the movie musical and the stage musical for Mamiya are both what's known as a jukebox musical, uh, much like Viva Forever was a showcase of Spice Girls mm. songs that they probably legally couldn't say were Spice Girls songs. Or if you've seen <laughs> uh, Jersey Boys, if you've seen American Idiot, if you've seen Carol King's Beautiful... Um, Waitress is not, but I kind of feel like Waitress is, it's all Sarah Borelli's. Um, basically, Jukebox Musical is an ode to one particular group, and Mamma Mia as a pop group has been around since, actually, 1972, um, when they became ABBA officially after the marriages, and so in 1999, Mamma Mia, the musical, the stage musical showed up at the West End and everybody went insane, and then in 2008... <laughs> They made a movie out of it in which a lot of people got drunk backstage while in Greece. And that is the thing. That is one of the things for me that is the iconography of this movie is the idea that people had a lot of fun. And when I don't think of this, I don't when I, mm. I don't think of this movie as a movie about camp. I think of this as a movie about the idea of summer fun, like on the beach, getaway, yeah. vacation. It's very like go go for me kind of thing mm. oh yes definitely um thinking about it there, there's very much sort of a party celebrationary vibe throughout a great deal of this film rather than over at camp there's a, a good amount of camp i mean the main the main three actress trio certainly bring a lot of that to yeah. the um to the stage especially when they have that dream sequence on the yacht as they're seeing their hearts out for money. I mean, that was money, money, wasn't it? It was, yes. Yes. But then you've got all the boys everywhere dancing and showing off to um, Sophie and, and such. And then that wonderful scene of uh, Does Your Mama Know down at the the juice bar on the sh on the shoreline, I think it is. Uh, yeah, at the bar on the shoreline the, the morning mm. after uh, the party gone wrong. <laughs> uh, I really like Does Your Mother Know in this context, too, because having a woman's, an older woman sing it to a younger man is much different because on stage when Abba sing it, it, it's one of the male lead songs, mm. which is a little weird. I think Does Your Mother Know works better in context of a woman singing to a younger man, especially Christine Bransky, who uh, most people that aren't theater people probably think of her as the... Um, sexy woman from the live action Grinch movie because she plays mm. Martha May Huvier's uh, foil and the one the Grinch is in love with secretly or not so secretly. Um, but Christine Bransky is a pretty well-known Broadway actress, uh, which was part of why she was probably brought into the cast. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think about this movie. I, I know that people have called it camp. I don't think of it as camp because I feel like it's just slightly too realistic. It does have dream sequences, but for me, I just consider this a fantasy movie. Um, I also think they market it more fantasy than camp, except for like the ending epilogue dream sequence uh, where they do the credits while they sing. Um, for me, it's more, uh, it, it's just a little too realistic. It's, it's not, it doesn't push the boat out in like that Pee Wee Herman sort of way. I just hmm. think of it more as like a dream sequence. Uh, I think that's how they marketed <laughs> it here in America. Uh, because when this movie came out, they marketed it as a thing you could go to see where it was like a mother-daughter event where they would do sing-alongs. Hmm. 
And so it was marketed more as like this dream fantasy afternoon getaway than it was necessarily, you know, like Tommy is more camp for mm. me than Mamma Mia is, you know, in some ways. It's not bad. I just, yeah. I just don't consider it camp myself. Over here, I recall, because I went and saw this whilst I was at uni, and I was quite blown away, because I hadn't actually seen the stage play, I knew nothing about it, I remember absolutely loving it, uh, it was sort of like the perfect summer flick to go and watch. In terms of marketing, um, I think there's more of reliance over here on marketing f musical theatre films as musicals. Um, they don't really mark it as like girl power flick or although that there wasn't quite a nice element of like strong female friendship and girl power within this movie yeah. but it was definitely came across as a as just like a, a proper fun musical film um but uh, i can certainly see why they might have done it and tweaked it in a slightly different way for an audience across the pond so to speak I will say this too, this film especially has the honor of being, especially at its time, it may not be anymore, mm. but it was the highest sold DVD home video release in the UK oh. um, in 2008. Now that may not be that way now, something else may have outsold <laughs> it, but it like, it outsold everything uh, in the UK. Uh, Y'all just kind of really fell in love with it. Uh, actually it got better mm. reception in the UK than it did even in Sweden, apparently, uh, which is kind of interesting. Uh, I also, I love the album too. I do wish mm. they had gotten Thank You for the Music into the movie because it's the secret mm. track on the album. And I think it's kind of amazing, for sure. I think they played it on the credits when it was over here. Um uh -huh. It was not actually in the movie, but I feel I seem to recall hearing it in the credits as I sat in the theater watching it. Well, but... we were all drunk in America on champagne and mimosas at that point. So <laughs> by the time the credits roll around, we're all properly wasted while watching it. <laughs> oh. oh, sorry, I'm just rem reminiscing about it now. It It's just one of those sheer fun films that comes out every once in a while. It's not taking itself seriously. You're right that it does feel like the actors are really in on it, having a blast filming this. Yeah. Um, I would have loved to have got a bit of like um, insight from actually the actors to see what they thought of the whole experience. Um, because this is quite an ensemble cast as well that they pulled it's, together. It's a, it's a big ensemble cast because you've got the main cast, you've got supporting cast, but also mm. the members of ABBA make cameo appearances. Uh, mm. Famously, the dancing queen piano player, uh, two of the Greek gods, and Agnes mm. is also one of the um, members of ABBA. But like uh, Philip Michael, who is Sky's best man and who likes Tanya, uh, is a supporting cast. Um, basically, everybody that's at the dinner uh when they sing here's to us i think is the name of the song let me see the soundtrack here mm. some of the songs i can't remember them, but i have to look at the soundtrack yeah uh so when all is said and done what they're sitting down to have their magical dinner at the end of the movie mm. uh all mm. of that is main and ensemble supporting cast it's a it's a big production i don't know what it looks like to do on stage i can imagine it's probably not quite as big on stage because that would be a, <laughs> a lot of people to fit onto a stage so mm. i would say that this was probably one of the more successful um musical theater to film adaptions i've actually seen um i can agree with that i the one ding i have about it is they did hire a whole bunch of people that couldn't sing and god bless <laughs> pierce brosnan god bless him from the this. bottom of my cold dead heart ah. but oh. I, I know he wanted so badly to be a lead in this film and he tried so hard and in interviews he always talks about well i was trying to channel tom waits and it's very romantic and i had family that had this name so i felt called to the role and that's great pierce you couldn't sing i mean you were fine as 007 but there is there is a limit to the fantasy. It was especially like during SOS. 
it's it's very difficult to like hear yeah. him against Meryl Streep, who has opera training. And so mm. it was no mistake that she was cast. And also, this isn't the first movie she'd sang in, so people were comfortable with her um, singing. Mm. Yeah, it was a bit of a, sh uh, a <laughs> okay, not a shock, mild shock. It was a slightly mild shock the, when he started singing it, and I thought, oh, good lord, <laughs> what on earth is this? Uh, um, but you're right. Yeah, I mean, he did try his best, bless him. Right, um, nice. So, I don't know. I presume that they were going with more. They wanted recognizable faces in order to sell. Yeah, the film. I think if they, stars. I think especially in America, if they had cast anyone less recognizable than yeah. Pierce Brosnan, it would have been a hard sell. Um, because I, I, because in '99, it was, it was, it came to the West End. I think it didn't start mm. in America, and so there was not really much familiarity with Mamma Mia, except for people that were doing Broadway and West End. Um. Mm. Yeah, because at the turn of the century, we're all we were all doing rent in America um, at that mm. point. Like we we were all getting real into indie and grungy stuff. So I don't know that Mamma Mia would have played without uh, Pierce Brosnan. I don't think. Here's the question for you. I'm not aware of this, so that's why I'm asking to sort of get some clarity from you about it. Yeah. How? well regarded and well known are abba in the states because they're a fairly big household name over here they were so waterloo which is the song that won them eurovision yeah. they actually uh they're one of the few bands and they talk about this on the abba website as part of their story uh no eurovision had a band had ever been big in america before abba uh, and hmm. so they were fairly big, but it was fairly big and like they had to tour and prove that they were a pop group here in America. Uh, right. So like the the sophomore song they had with their first album and people think maybe One Hit Wonders, they had the same problem in America that they had in Europe. Uh, hmm. But but people love their music. But uh, in so in America, Broadway goes in like waves where it's like mm. a 20-year cycle of stuff that's well-known, and then at like the beginning and end of the 20-year cycle, new stuff gets produced. So in 99, when Mamma Mia was coming to the West End, mm. um, I'm pretty sure 99 was when Rent was coming out of previews, and so we were going into the next phase of Broadway. And so mm. Mamma Mia doesn't quite fit in until we start doing Lion King after that. Uh, it's not bad. It's just it also in America when they did uh, billboards from Mamma Mia, it looked a lot like Muriel's Wedding to me. It looked a <laughs> lot like the promos from Muriel's Wedding, the film, and so I didn't connect with Mamma Mia right away because I was like, "Well, I've seen this it's Muriel's Wedding. I don't need to see it a musical. It's fine." Um, <laughs> also, like over here as far as i'm aware you know colin first was someone i was aware of because i'd enjoyed him in other films he plays straight and gay uh characters but like mm. stolen scars guard dominic cooper uh julie waters um i'm not sure if she'd been in anything i'd seen up until that point so i i think it was it's an interesting thing because it feels very British almost to me, except for Parrish and Merrill. Mm. Um, Dominic Cooper hadn't played Preacher yet, so he wasn't really big on screen. Uh, Amanda Seyfried, we'd uh, only really yeah. seen in Mean Girls at that point, so I had no idea mm. she could sing. Um, and then she released a fabulous single version of Man After Midnight for this movie specifically. Yeah, but like, I don't think anything julie waters had done came over across the pond before mamma mia mm. she was in billy elliot but again billy elliot is a um is mm. sort That's... of british thing transplanted to america and it so doesn't british. always work yeah uh, so british <laughs> yeah no i know i know what you mean um dominic cooper i'd only really seen him in the history boys uh before this so that was a slight pleasant surprise to see him pop up in, uh, he 
is a fabulous stage actor. He did, there is this really great kind of, it's not an ancient play, but it's a really old play where it's a stepmom in love with like um, the stepson who's marrying into the family or something. And oh. he played an amazing character that's have this having uh, this woman like bear down on him and and i think he did it opposite helen mirren when he did it and he was really young in it uh but i remember reading uh, about it and seeing clips of him doing it and i was just astonished by him again i didn't know he could sing but also sky does not have the biggest role in this movie so if he couldn't sing um <laughs> you wouldn't have missed much but i i'm really glad dominic cooper has uh made definitely a career mm. for himself but yeah this was really his kind of first big breakout role outside of theater mm. yeah also yes. Juan Pablo de Pace is in this uh which is fun he plays the uh guy that Harry gets a crush on um mm. that helps Harry to realize that he's gay and so uh Juan Pablo de Pace who was in uh Dallas um and then is in the Fuller House Full House spinoff um I'm I'm just amused that he started his career uh in Mamma Mia so yeah well that's great that it's one of those films that you come back to and then re you realize that certain people were in it that you don't recall or you're reading about some actor's career and then you like as you're looking through their credits list then you're like oh i didn't realize uh, or i didn't remember that they were in this as well it's one of those great little things yeah. i occasionally come up across uh, it's a little weird habit of mine i tend to go on a little trip like reading up about you know what someone's done in the past to what they're planning to do and then i noticed their whole repertoire of previous productions and it's like oh that's interesting i'll check that at some point Da, da, da. which is fun I also find mamma mia is a good movie mm. for people that want to understand uh the interplay between um music and beats because a mm. lot of this movie takes place on what in one location on an island and there's different parts of the location to go to but yes. for someone studying how to do a film musical or how to do a transition what physical beats versus emotional beats look like. Mm -hmm. All the songs are very emotional, even when they don't move. Uh, Slipping Through My Fingers is a great one if you're looking to see how emotional beats work. Uh, Our Last Summer is a really great emotional beat song, but then you have like Honey, Honey, Money, 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 uh, Chick to Tita, Dancing Queen, Lay All Your Love on Me. Those are all more physical but they all work together because not just because they're all Mamma Mia songs but because you can tell how they move not just the story but the locations forward in some mm. ways film musicals are more obvious about this because people give that break because it's escapism um, yes but Mamma Mia does a really great job in knowing not just its audience but kind of the emotions of the audience um uh, this is not the most complicated story in the world. Mamma Mia is about a girl no. who don't know, doesn't know who her dad is, and there's three possible candidates, and they all get dragged to an island, and if it was a horror movie, everybody would get murdered, but it's not, <laughs> so everybody's fine. And at the end, Donna ends up with Pierce Brosnan uh, because one of them is gay and the other one is destined to be with Julie Waters. Um, <laughs> that's fine. Uh, I... Yeah, I, I I think any hate this movie earns outside of the fact that Pierce Brosnan can't sing is probably due to misogyny here in America, or it's just the fact that people people really want movies to be, you know, it's the same thing Batman has as an issue where people want it to be like so gritty and so Christian Bale because that's what they remember. But like this is a fun, playful movie. It is more feminine. Even mm -hmm. the masculine characters are slightly more feminine. They're like they're essentially on vacation from machismo, um, and mm -hmm. it's just got a lot of warm tones, and it has mm -hmm. you know a lot of really great lens flares because they get a lot of like outdoor time. Uh, Does your mother know is a great anthem, and it's great to see a older woman singing it because I think there's. Yes. I think there's a lot in that subversion 
that is really cool. Uh, also, there's a reference to Aphrodite's fountain, which is an excuse to get everyone like wet and make them all take their shirts off. And that's fun. <laughs> yeah. um, it's just, it's really fun. Yeah. This is another one of those movies mm -hmm. where, you know, it's not going to like be a groundbreaking thing, but it's going to be fun. And it was marketed as such. It wasn't marketed to be groundbreaking. It was marketed as, a, oh, no. hey, yeah. it's almost Mother's Day or yeah. it's after Mother's Day. Take your mom to see this movie. Come and do the sing along. Yeah. You like ABBA. We like ABBA. Everybody likes ABBA. <laughs> well, exactly. Like the po posters over here were all about like the main cast, like dancing on the cover or having a great time, etc. I don't think the advertising ever gave the impression that this was going to be a particularly narratively complex or like gritty drama yeah. um i suppose one could say like another as you say alongside the ps brosnan singing a criticism that could be leveled at this film is it's very sitcommy in yeah. its sort of like convoluted plot of how people are not talking to each other or they're not tell they're not just having a sit down in a conversation and the daughter's not just saying to her mom i've decided to try and find out who my birth father is so that i can um have my dad at my wedding um it's not, i like that, it's not as, like that i like that as a criticism yeah. as though that's what people everywhere do because if we actually did that as a society we wouldn't have the aita reddit where people ask if they've made the wrong decision in life like we don't talk to each other in the real world um so most of the posters for mamma mia the film here in america are probably the same ones you got you've got the dancing mm. cover uh there is a cover with donna um blocking the three men from getting into the villa um there is a really great movie poster with uh sophie amanda sifford's character in her wedding dress and they've kind of focused on the blue door and the blue blue and white of greece uh, but mm -hmm. mostly it's the dancing. Uh, if you're looking at a poster with a brunette in a wedding dress and it's all white, that is the stage version. Um, but anytime you're looking at like a Donna and the Dynamos thing, that's mostly film people. Because um, I don't think yeah. Donna and the Dynamos are as big a deal in the... I, I feel like on stage they wouldn't be as big as a deal as, as they were. They They were kind of big... In the movie, they made them seem much larger than life, which I really loved, actually. Mm -hmm. um, yes. I loved the Don and the Dynamo sequence. Not going to lie. It was almost as if it was like a narrative surrogate for ABBA themselves. You know, like larger than life, a fun band, and they're just like embracing their music and like building it out and such. Yeah. Hmm. I want to touch upon a point you made before about the men in the film. Um, because whilst there is definitely a masculine energy to a lot of the cast, like with the mate with the the three possible dads and Dominic, this <clears throat> character of Sky, it never feels like it's an overwhelming or overbearing masculine energy to me. Um, like Sky's got his bachelor party and everything, but so does Sophie have her bachelorette party and like it never feels like either of them are sort of like a lesser to the other yeah. um <laughs> if anything like the scene where the girls go wild on the prowl for men and yes. the men are hiding actually <laughs> made me smirk slightly which What's is great fantastic. is that most of his bachelor party are there for the tail end of Lay All Your Love on Me and then at the bachelorette party. But then they mostly disappear until the morning after and then they're gone. Like they don't come <laughs> to the wedding at all. The wedding's in too small a chapel for the amount of people that were at that bachelor bachelorette party. Um, oh, they're just going to be at the reception yeah. afterwards. <laughs> yes. Uh, what's interesting yeah. about the men of the movie is that not only are the women more dominant, but the men are highly creative. Um, even Colin Firth, who plays Harry Bright, who's kind of a banker and who's kind of the safe, soft option, um, he dreams of being like Stellan Skarsgård, Bill, 
who is a Swedish sailor and travel writer, uh, even Pierce Brosnan as an American architect is very creative and he connects with Sophie because of that creativity. There's something very much, there's something very vacation about this because, mm -hmm. you know, even a macho guy that has a macho job uh, like even a metalhead could envision themselves in this universe because mm. the men are creative and you can really kind of imprint yourself on one of them because everybody gets lost. Yeah. Everybody wants to run away. Um, every man has, <laughs> you know, a secret crush they loved that, that let them down. Um, and it's, mm. it's an interesting thing to think. I cannot help but think that, um, this rom-com was written by Katherine Johnson and directed by Felita Lloyd. So there's, you know, women really at the helm of this. And even in mm. ABBA, even though two men technically do tend to write the songs, they sing with their wives or their ex-wives because even after they split up, they still sing together. Mm. Um, it's kind of like Fleetwood Mac where there's male members, but when you think of Fleetwood Mac, you really just think of Stevie Nicks, to be perfectly honest. Mm. Um, yeah, there's something about, maybe it's also the fact that it's like beachy and they spend most of the movie like half out of their shirts or not in their shirts at mm. all. Uh, there's something very vulnerable, something very like, something about the sun being there. There's not, there are mm. interior spaces in the film, but we spend most of Mamma Mia outdoors. We spend most yeah. of it in the daytime, except for mm. when you definitely need to be in the night. Um, even in the courtyard of the villa, except for Dancing Queen and the Goat House, all the, all, everything that happens in this movie that is mm. really important, except for the proposal, takes place outdoors. Um, you're yeah. just surrounded by nature, essentially, mm. and sand and alcohol. Which is kind of nature. Kind of nature. Nature does help make alcohol. It's kind of nature. It almost feels like um, a Dionysi style party. Uh, yes, except there's no drag, which is something Dionysus is known oh. for. Uh, mm -hmm. But details, details. Um, yeah. I I'd argue one little, small little point again with the men is it, it's in, it's interesting to see how what a quick and easy camaraderie. They develop amongst themselves there's no sort of like conflict or like rivalry and such it's more like oh we've been pushed into this situation together by this wild the wild antics of this girl and you know what we're just gonna make the most of it sort of thing yeah i, I like that as well they don't really fight about it they decide no. individually that they're willing to step up to be sophie's dad uh, which does lead, of course, to the great moment of the bachelorette party where she faints from the anxiety of the trouble she has caused herself. Um, something oh, what really... was me? <laughs> oh, what was me? Yes, I have too many good things and everyone's <laughs> dancing and celebrating me. Um, one of the things I like about Mamma Mia specifically in this time, because now the Barbie movie is out, is that when Mamma Mia came out, it was paired against The Dark Knight, which was mm. um, really the first very gritty dark batman film and so like with barbie and oppenheimer it feels very mamma mia and the dark knight all over again which a lot of people are very happy uh to point out or as some people quoted the dark mama yes something like that. <laughs> uh, yeah i mean i actually don't mind that at all i think again again it's a sense of camaraderie why on earth do we need to pit these movies in a Marvel versus DC, Coke versus Pepsi style rivalry, people can go enjoy a bit of like bubbly campness and then go enjoy a bit more of a serious historical fiction drama. You well, should be allowed I, to enjoy yeah. both. And, and I would argue something like The Dark Knight is camp in its own way. It's kind of camp in the same way that. Um, it's kind of camp in the same way that drag kings are camp, where they're doing things with masculinity. There's something very mm. drag about Batman to begin with. Uh, it's just, you know, masked man drag as opposed to femme drag, um, to me. 
That's what, that's what I think. Yeah. Um, well, the Joker always goes on about how obsessed Batman is with him. There's a whole there's a whole established subtext between them, so you know. <laughs> I also do uh, in Mamma Mia. I love the set design. Uh, mm. Honey, honey, as a song, is really good if you don't deep dive too much into the lyrics of what Sophie's singing about. But there's a great sequence in Honey, Honey, where the three girls have been reunited, and we're going to see that again with Tanya, Rosie, and Donna. But we see it first with Sophie, Ali, and Lisa, and they sing Honey, Honey, and they frolic back up to the house. And then <laughs> the way they set up the front of this house so that the two girls that are her best friends and her backup, her Tanya and Rosie, uh, they end up disappearing behind windows while she comes out on a balcony. Yes. And I think that's just poetry right there. Like, if I <laughs> ever have to do dream sequence song musical in my real life, I would want that Honey Honey choreography at the end. Uh, mm -hmm. not, not thinking too much about what she's singing about exactly, uh, or the <laughs> fact that she breached her mother's trust by taking her diary, but that, that's a very mm -hmm. small, it's a very small thing. It's very, it's a very, like, youthful thing that she does there's something very young about the film it feels very nice um yes. even even when the characters are like bitter and angry at each other it doesn't break the feeling of niceness and the feeling of vacation mm -hmm. and i i really i really like that i think it's important to have movies that allow you escapism um mm -hmm. and i think we kind of oh, forget yeah. that in looking in looking at the idea of indie versus big blockbuster like you can still do an indie that is about escapism, uh, mm. like the Escape from Tomorrow movie, uh, which was the guerrilla movie that was shot at Disneyland, um, that the guy never made a lot of money from because a lot of people just didn't connect with it. But mm. uh, Mamma Mia is yeah. kind of the case for both a blockbuster, but it feels like an indie movie. It feels like a mm. vacation experience. Um, everyone behind the scenes was drinking a lot of whatever alcohol they drink in Greece <laughs> and they're having a good time and it is reflected in the film I don't think it's reflected in here in the sequel the here I go again Mamia, uh, because that did not take place in Greece that took place in Croatia um, and though most of the cast returned it has a very different vibe to mm. me so I want to touch upon quickly a particular since it seems you mentioned aesthetic and song choices that sort of match the themes that they're going for and such yeah to myself perhaps one of the most memorable parts of this movie is just how perfectly they encapsulated the energy within lay all your love upon me if Pierce Brosnan's voice mildly shocked me then the scene of Sky and Sophie singing seductively to each other and crawling along the sand to each other oh honey there was such a trying to put it in nice words a, a connective energy between them that certainly stirred something in the pit of my stomach when i watched it and then I, yeah. Sky's boyfriends crawled out of the water and interrupted the whole damn thing <laughs> I, I do, I really, I do like that. I do like that as a seduction song because it feels almost like mm -hmm. a remix of how yes. Leia, All Your Love On Me feels on stage when ABBA just does it as a song. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's it's interesting because the whole time I'm thinking, yes, this is romantic, but God, now there's sand everywhere. I would just be so annoyed <laughs> by the amount of sand. Uh, I'm not really much of a beach version. Uh, there's something interesting, though, about making that a duet between young lovers. It's the same thing as Does Your Mother Know, uh, mm. Slipping Through My Fingers as a mother-daughter song. Uh, even the winner takes it all. Um, because if you listen to other version of ABBA songs, if you oh, listen to yes. the like erasure cover of um, their music, just it's an interesting way to remix it, but still honor the source material. And it's part of the fantasy is the idea because sure. i mean the fantasy is yes love but it could also be yes but also your international frat brothers can come and scoop you up to go to your bachelor party that's also a nice fantasy too at least for me um <laughs> what's interesting too is that in the ensemble numbers the amount of ensemble doesn't take away from it i think 
Dancing Queen is stronger because it moves from being uh, just the three women in the bedroom and then to the all the women of, of the island around them. I think Lay All Your Love on Me is strong because it's a great transition. Uh, everyone loves a good jet ski number. It's uh, Bo Derek built a career off of uh, running on the beach. So I'm not mad about it. Um, mm. But yeah, there was a lot of great energy between Dominic Cooper and Amanda Seyfried. Um, she's always been a very competent actress. So mm. she she knew how to move her body and she made it work. She she understood the assignment, <laughs> as the children say. So. Indeed. Uh, so we've got a few minutes left. So do you have any additional thoughts closing thoughts before we wrap up today i like mamma mia i kind of wish they hadn't made here i go again mamma mia because i don't think the sequel serves the plot and also there's only so many abba songs in existence <laughs> um i loved the fourth wall breaking deadpool-esque end credit thing they did with having the don and the dynamos come out and having them if anything is camp that end credit scene is camp so <laughs> Yes. Uh, I think overall, uh, it, it's just such a perfect little picture. Yes, there's little um, sort of qualms with it, like the little faults and such. But, you know, as adaptions go, as musical films go, it's great. It's certainly one of those things I think you'd struggle not to enjoy if you sat down and watched it. So... Yeah, it gets a very nice high score recommendation for me. Um, especially right now, if you have an outdoor theater that's playing movies at a pool and they're not playing Jaws, why not suggest Mamma Mia? Um, <laughs> I think that's a nice change of pace. I, I think this is this is kind of the perfect movie to have a drink and to kind of watch by the pool or watch at night, do like a picnic event. Uh, this is the kind of thing where you could watch it at home alone you could turn it into a small event for you and your lover, or you could make it into like a big fun thing where people dress up, you know, as mm. their favorite character or dress up as just like wearing the Grecian flag. This is the kind of thing where, especially the American promos, turning it into a party really got the vibe of it is that it's a party. Um, yeah. Just like everything here, everything is gay, even the straight stuff. Uh, we mm. want to thank you for tuning in Enjoy. to another summer short. And we'll be back next time with another summer short. Um, we have another summer short coming your way. Um, don't forget to lay all your love on your lover consensually. <laughs> we'll see uh, you next time. Ta-da, everyone. Bye. Ta -da.